I wish there was a way I could because then I cannot move the slides, right? Somebody will have to advance the slides from there, right? Yes, sir. We will uh, we will uh, move the slide from here. Yeah, that's always a little bit of a problem. Yeah, that um, is correct. So okay, let me try one again. more time to log yeah, out and yeah, please, yeah, yeah, yeah please, yeah, because I would rather. Good day, sir. Good afternoon. Nito. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, let me try this. Share content. Yes, perfect. Okay, hang on. Don't get excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably you, uh, you can move the slide. You can write. Yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, uh, hang on. Can you see it? Yes, 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 yes. Y you can see the um, slides changing. Yes, it, it's moving. It is moving. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Problem. I let, think it, so. let, it let it be like that. Let it be like that. No, yeah. Okay. I will not change anything and mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think uh, I know what the problem was. I think because I was choosing the the browser option, and I think I needed to choose the app option. So I went and uploaded the app. Uh, okay. So anyway, I think that was the reason, or at least I want to believe that was the reason. <laughs> that is okay. So this should be Probably we'll start in one minute time, sir. It's okay. Yeah, no worries.
Gaudam, you can start. Gaudam. Okay, sir. Good evening, everyone joined in this meeting. I am glad to welcome you all to the technical talk series titled Transtech Talk Series organized by KSCST, National Transportation Planning and Research Center, NATPAC, Kerala. In this series, eminent experts across the globe delivered the knowledge and experience on different areas of transportation engineering, and it aims to provide professionals, researchers, and students in the transportation field an opportunity to expand their knowledge and equip them to develop better transportation facilities. Today, the seventh talk of this series will be delivered by Dr. Deeraj Butch, Professor and Dean, Undergraduate Studies, Rochester Institute of Technology, New York, USA, on the topic Performance Evaluation of Long Life Rigid Payments in Michigan. Without any delay, I would like to invite Dr. Samson Matthew, Director, KCST NATPAC, for the welcome address. Uh, good morning to Professor Deeraj Butch and uh, good afternoon to all my uh, friends joined uh, for this seven uh, trans, tech, so, uh, talk, uh, trans tech talk series organized by the Highway and Bridges uh, Division of uh, Transportation, National Transportation Planning and Research Center. Uh, I welcome uh, all the participants because a uh, good number of participants are joining from different parts of the uh, country and uh, our own uh, scientist. Uh, and uh, process like uh, Professor uh, Kunjriya B. Isaac, Dr. Nidhu Roy are also already joined. Uh, we, I expect that there is more faculty from other uh, uh, the educational institutions also will uh, join. So I welcome all of you to this uh, seventh uh, talk series. We, the National Transportation Planning and Research Center, uh, we are organizing this uh, talk on a monthly basis. Earlier, uh, we had uh, experts like uh, Dr. Srinivas S. Fulgurta, Dr. Rajiv B. Malik, Professor R. J. Krishnan, Engineer Tony Matthew, Dr. Varun Vargis, and uh, Dr. Sunanda Dise Nayage. And today, we have uh, with us Dr. Ramirez. Which I welcome you, Professor, to this uh, talk series. Thank you for your time and thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, you have you agreed to uh, deliver this uh, uh, the talk. Uh, welcome you, sir, to this uh, program. I welcome uh, all other participants, uh, the our my scientist, process, and the process scholars uh, who are attending this program. And welcome all of you to this uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the welcome speech. Now I request Dr. Salni Yu, Scientist, Highways and Bridges Division, KCST NATPAC, to introduce the speaker of today's session. Thank you, Gautam. It is with great privilege that I introduce today's speaker for the seventh Transtech Talk Series, Dr. Neeraj Buj. He is Dean of Undergraduate Studies and Associate Provost for Student Success and a Professor of Payment Engineering at the Rochester Institute of Technology, New York. He holds MS degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and PhD from Texas A&M University in College Station. From 1996 to 2023, Dr. Bush worked at Michigan State University and served in various leadership roles including Associate Dean for Undergraduate Students in the College of Engineering, Chairperson of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Dr. Butch has managed large interdisciplinary research teams and has worked on numerous projects funded by different agencies. Dr. Butch has performed research on characterization of Portland cement concrete mixtures. He also explored the impact of Portland cement concrete mixtures on payment design, its performance, payment responses, performance modeling, and payment preservation. 
Dr. Bhuj is also an award-winning instructor who has been teaching undergraduate and graduate courses related to concrete materials and pavement engineering. Dr. Bhuj has been a past member of different TRB committees and an ASTRO TAG. He is also a member of AAC and TNDA Highway Payments Committee, AAC LTPP Task Committee, and the chairperson past of ACI Committee T25 on rigid payments. Dr. Bush has served on the board of International Society Concrete Payments, ISCP, as its past president, and he is now an honorary member of ISCP. Sir, I welcome you once again to this Tech Talk series from all the NATPAC fraternity and all the others who have joined for this talk. Welcome you, sir, once again. Thank you very much. So is it, uh, am I good to start? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, again, thank you so much for this invitation and, and the introduction. And what I'm going to share with you today is a research project that I was uh, engaged with uh, when I was at Michigan State University. The project is over uh, and the findings have been reported back to uh, the funding agency, and uh, this was um, an experiment that the Michigan Department of Transportation launched, uh, and they wanted us to evaluate uh, the performance of um, long life pavements, both asphalt as well as uh, concrete pavements. Uh, of course, my focus is going to be on um, on concrete pavements, but this was a broader study for both uh, uh, both pavement types. So, before I get into the details of the project, I, I want to acknowledge uh, the research team that I was part of. This is a multi-university research team uh, led by Michigan State University, uh, as well as uh, a large number of graduate students um, who worked extremely hard uh, to make this project a success. And of course, um, uh, not, none of this would have been possible without the, the funding uh, that we received from uh, the Michigan uh, Department of Transportation or MDOT. So clearly, um, uh, I want to recognize uh, their, their funding. So what are long life pavements? And there are several definitions of long life concrete pavements. Um, but this definition that you see in front of you is generically accepted uh, across the world. Um, so the first element of this definition is the life of the pavement, the design life of the pavement. And we are typically designing long life concrete pavements for 30 to 50 years. Now there are instances where pavements have been designed for longer than 50 years, but, but for this conversation, we are gonna look at 30 and 50 year designs. The other significant attribute of a long life concrete pavement is the minimal structural distresses uh, that the pavement uh, needs to exhibit. That is in terms of transverse cracking, faulting, spalling. So in order for a pavement to qualify as long life, uh, the structural distresses have to be minimal. In addition to the structural distresses, the material distresses, the material related distresses uh, should also be absent or or minimal. Uh, for example, uh, durability cracking or freeze thaw damage of the concrete or alkali silica reaction. These are all examples of material related distresses that should not be present in a long life concrete pavement. And then the functionality of the pavement, the right quality, um, the friction, uh, the reduced um, uh, pavement tire noise, these all are elements of a good functional pavement. So all these qualities have to be at their best. So a smooth ride, good friction and reduced uh, pavement tire noise. And then of course, minimal interventions related to repair and rehabilitations because they factor into user cost, user delays, uh, so also, if the pavement is designed appropriately, constructed appropriately, with minimal structural distresses, no material distresses, good functional properties, then the interventions, especially significant interventions in terms of rehabilitation, will be, will be minimized. So these are, as I said, suggested attributes of a long-life concrete pavement. 
So hypothetically and, 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 and hopefully practically, how do we achieve these, uh, achieve these attributes? I, I relate this to a jigsaw puzzle where there are several pieces that need to all fit together at the same time. And the pieces that are very critical to long life pavements, one of course is the design, the design and the inputs that go into design, the material characterization uh, have to be accurate. So the, so the structural design is very critical. The second piece is the quality of the material that we are using, not only the concrete that we are using, but also the underlying layers in a concrete pavement, the aggregate base course, the, the sand sub base, the road bed, all these materials have to be of, of, of uh, high quality. That's important. Then, of course, um, you can have great material, great design, but then the quality of construction has to be also noteworthy because without good quality construction, uh, good design and good materials really don't mean anything. And then the fourth piece is the implementation of the specifications. So specifications do exist, but these specifications need to then be implemented to make sure that a properly designed concrete pavement using good materials with good construction quality uh, are implemented. If these four pieces fit together, then there is a very high probability that the pavement that you're producing will be a long life concrete pavement. And the message I want to send here, and I, and I hope it resonates with everyone participating in this, is that when we design a concrete pavement, or for that matter, when you design any pavement, you want to approach it as a system rather than individual pieces. It has to be an integrated systems approach, knowing, knowing that structural design, materials, quality construction, and specs, they all interact with, other, with each other. So I, I, I draw a comparison to a buffet, that when you go to a buffet, we pick and choose things we like to eat. That's not how you want to design a concrete pavement. You want to design a concrete pavement in a way that everything is well connected and well integrated. It cannot be a little bit of this and a little bit of that, because then uh, the pavement is not going to result in in long life. So I think if you if you if you don't get anything from this presentation, I hope you get this message that any pavement that you design, whether it's concrete or asphalt. Um, that there be an integrated system uh, approach uh, to the design of, uh, of the pavement. So with that as a background, uh, what I'd like to share with you this, uh, this evening is briefly describe the projects that were part of this experiment, um, share with you some of the material data, uh, then also share with you some structural uh, analysis that we did using the falling weight deflectometer and then close with some concluding uh, concluding remarks. So, as I noted, there were a total of four projects uh, that were constructed. Two of them were hot mix asphalt projects. One was a 30 year design. The other was a 50 year design. And then there were two Portland cement concrete projects, which is the focus of this presentation. Uh, one was a 30 year uh, design project consist consisted of two sections. And then the other was a 50 year uh, design life that consisted of uh, three sections. Um, and these projects were, were, consist uh, were constructed on the east side of the state of Michigan, as well as on the west side uh, of the state of Michigan. And you can see um, the approximate locations of these, these projects uh, on, on your screen. But as I said, our focus is going to be on the two Portland cement concrete projects uh, on Interstate 69, as well as US Highway 131. So for the Interstate 69, some basic, the 30 year design, uh, these are some of the basic structural and material facts. Um, the joint spacing, these are all jointed plain concrete pavements. So there is no reinforcement in the body of the concrete. The only reinforcement that exists in this concrete pavement are at the joints, the transverse joints, as well as the longitudinal joints. So there are dowel bars in the transverse joints and tie bars in the longitudinal joints. Um, 
The contraction joint spacing was about four and a half meters, which is quite typical of jointed plain concrete pavements. The dowel diameter for the long life concrete pavements was about 38 millimeters or one and a half inches. Um, the water cement ratio, the water cementitious ratio, actually, because there were pozzolans that were used in the design of the concrete mix or in the production of the concrete mix was approximately 0.42. Uh, the compressive strength um, was targeted about 25 megapascals. Now, in the United States, we don't use cubes. Uh, we use uh, concrete cylinders. Uh, so this is cylinder strength, not cube strength. And the, th the target and trained air was about 6.5%. Now, in the state of Michigan, um, we do go through a lot of freeze-thaw cycles. Um, the, summer, the winter is extremely cold with a lot of snow and ice. And then, of course, the summer is warm, uh, so the so the pavement does experience. Uh, uh, excuse me, the pavement does experience, or the concrete does experience um, multiple cycles of freeze and thaw, and therefore, and training air uh, is a must because air entrainment helps in freeze thaw resistance um, uh, for the, increases the freeze thaw resistance of the concrete. So this is a, and then of course. Michigan DOT also constructed their regular uh, cross-section pavements, which is a 20-year design for concrete pavements. So what you're seeing here on your screen is the 20-year design along um, Interstate 69. And again, this was a jointed plain concrete pavement with nine and a half inches of concrete slab on an open graded drainage course that was then placed on a sand sub-base, which was compacted in place. And then of course, this was placed on a roadbed or a natural subgrade. So this is what the 20 year design looked like. And if I contrast this with the 50 year design, excuse me, the 30 year design, the thickness of the slab was 10 and a half inches. So there was a one inch difference between the slab thickness of the regular pavement versus the long life pavement. And then the foundation layers were significantly different and significantly thicker. So the cross sections were significantly thicker than the regular, the 20 year design. So there was a open graded drainage course that was then placed on an aggregate base followed by a sand sub base. And then the first 12 inches or one foot of the subgrade was cement stabilized. So there was a significant um, foundation layer under the concrete pavement. The other significant difference between the 20 year design and the 30 year design, besides the 10 year design difference, was the diameter of the dowel bars. So for the 20 year design, the diameter of the dowel bar was 1, 1.25 inches or one and a quarter inches, whereas the diameter of the dowel bars for the thicker pavement, the 10 and a half inch pavement, was 1.5 inches or 38 millimeters, as I had noted in my previous slide. So again, this gives you sort of a structural comparison between the 20-year design and the 30-year design. For the US-131, which was a 50-year design, uh, again, very similar uh, structural characteristics. Again, a jointed plain concrete pavement. Uh, 4.5 meters contraction joint spacing, uh, dowel diameter of 38 millimeters, uh, water cementitious ratio of 0.42, uh, target cylinder compressive strength of 3,500 PSI or 25 megapascals, uh, and uh, a target and trained air of 6.5%. Uh, again, here, uh, a 20-year design was constructed as well as a 50-year design was constructed. Now, if you look at the 20 year design and the 50 year design cross sections, the slab thickness is exactly the same. Michigan DOT chose to um, design the same slab, th slab thickness for both the concrete pavements. Uh, so the slab thicknesses were 10 and a half inches, um, which is approximately 275 millimeters uh, of thickness. Uh, but there was significant difference uh, in the foundation layers. The 50 year design again had the same kind of foundation as the 30-year design. Uh, 
Um, you know, there was a open graded drainage course, an aggregate base, uh, a sand sub base, and then a chemically stabilized uh, subgrade. So a significantly strong and uh, thick foundation for the 50 year design. So this gives you an idea of what the uh, pavement cross sections look like uh, both for the 30 year as well as the 50 year design. And then we are comparing these uh, to the 20 year design uh, concrete pavements. So, uh, moving on to the material characterization, of course, there were a lot of tests done and I don't have time to go through all the testing, but I've sort of picked some, uh, I've picked some examples. So we looked at uh, mechanical properties and the three common mechanical properties that we looked at were the compressive strength uh, that was uh, either based on cylinders or cores that were extracted from the concrete slabs um, and then measured the elastic modulus on the cylinders or the cores uh, and then also flexural strength on, on beams. Uh, we also then um, uh, measured and quantified the coefficient of thermal expansion of the of the concrete, and I'll explain why that is important. And then, of course, we looked at some material properties. Uh, we looked at de-icer scaling. Um, we looked at absorptivity of of moisture because the scaling and the absorption capacity of the of the concrete slab are are important, especially in freeze thaw in freeze thaw zones. And then, of course, we looked at the resistivity, which is really a measure of permeability uh, of the concrete. Because again, when 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 you construct pavements in freestyle conditions, in winter, salt is put on the pavements to minimize the icing of the pavement, and you want to make sure that the chlorides in the salt do not permeate into the concrete and cause material-related durability problems. So. Having a low permeability concrete is what you are targeting uh, when you are when you have to construct any concrete pavement, but more significantly uh, the long life concrete pavement. So these were these are some examples of the testing that we did on uh, the concrete that was used to pave uh, the long life um, pavement. This just gives you um, a summary of the of the concrete mix design. Uh, that was used for Interstate 69 and US 131. There is nothing significant about this mixed design other than um, this was a uh, this did have supplementary cementitious material. Uh, it did have uh, granulated blast furnace slag um, that was mixed with um, Type One Portland Portland cement. Uh, about 30% supplementary cementitious materials were used, which is quite typical uh, for the state of Michigan when they construct a concrete pavement. So there was nothing, uh, there was nothing very significant or eye-catching as far as um, the concrete mix design was 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 concerned. But I thought I'd, I'd share the mix design with you uh, just for the sake of completeness. So. Um, here is a um, you know some data from uh, from the compressive strength. Uh, so hopefully you can see my cursor. This is um, comparing the uh, long life with uh, the the regular concrete pavement, uh, the regular concrete for I sixty nine, and you can notice if you recall the target strength was thirty five hundred psi or twenty five megapascals. So compressive strength was really not an issue. Uh, when it came to uh, whether it was uh, conventional concrete or long life concrete pavements, the compressive strength targets were met both for I-69 as well as US-131 concrete. The same goes with the modulus of rupture or the flexural strength. Uh, we, you know, uh, they were all in excess of uh, 700 PSI or 750 PSI. So there really was no issue with meeting the target of compressive strengths or flexural strengths for concretes in either of the pavements. So that, that wasn't an issue at all. The same thing with the elastic modulus. Um, uh, again, the elastic modulus was well within the acceptable range uh, for the design and construction of concrete pavements. Uh, so again, there was nothing alarming about uh, the elastic modulus properties of the concrete. Um, moving on to the 
Durability properties, we, we measured the volume of air using the conventional uh, air meter. Uh, and remember the target was six and a half percent. The tolerances are usually plus minus 1%. So you're looking at anywhere from five and a half to seven and a half or 8% volume of air. Uh, and then we also ran another test um, using the super air meter, and I'm not sure if the super air meter has made its way uh, to India, um, but the super air meter is a modification of the conventional uh, air test uh, that we may all, that we are all familiar with. Um, but what the super air meter does is it allows allows the contractor or the testing company to measure not only the percent or the volume of entrained air, um, but it also gives you a sense of the distribution of the air bubbles uh, in the concrete, uh, which, is, um, which is also a critical piece um, uh, in determining the, the freeze thaw susceptibility or the freeze thaw durability of the, of the concrete. And a typical SAM number or a super air meter number is about 0.2. So if the concrete is within 0.2 and 0.25, then the concrete has the right volume of air as well as the appropriate spacing between the air bubbles that are entrained in the concrete. So for the most part, both I-69 and US-131 based on our sampling and the data that we were collecting showed that the distribution of the air bubbles and the volume of air uh, were adequate uh, to resist uh, freeze thaw uh, uh, to 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 resist freeze thaw damage so again from uh, from the volume of air and distribution of of air bubbles there was nothing that was alarming or something that should have given us any pause um as I noted, we also ran, uh, and I'm going to spend some time on this slide. Um, we ran the, the coefficient of thermal expansion uh, test on concrete, and this is a linear uh, expansion and contraction of the concrete mixture. Um, in in the state of Michigan, the coarse aggregate is is always uh, limestone, is dolomitic limestone or um, or calcareous limestone, so either it's calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate limestones uh, as part of coarse aggregates. And the expansion and contraction of a concrete core or a concrete slab is directly related to the geology of the aggregate that is used. Um, if you recall, Concrete by volume is about 75% aggregate. So it should not come as a surprise that the thermal properties of the aggregate are going to dominate the thermal properties of the concrete. The cement paste is not going to dominate the, the thermal properties of the concrete. Um, and when you measure the coefficient of thermal expansion, uh, the, the last two columns are showing you the coefficient of the linear uh, coefficient of thermal expansion of concrete, both uh, in inches per inches degree Celsius, as well as degree Fahrenheit. So typically for limestones, especially the calcium carbonate limestones, uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion is around six to six and a half into 10 raised to minus six degrees per Celsius. Um, so other than one sample, which I have noted as an outlier, uh, that could be a testing error or, um, it, it's hard to tell why that coefficient of thermal expansion was significantly higher than, than the others. But for the most part, the other coefficient of thermal expansions were within what you would expect from, from field cores. The reason why coefficient of thermal expansion is so important is, and, and, and I don't have time to explain, uh, get into, the, into joint design, but joint design is extremely dependent on, significantly dependent on coefficient of thermal expansion. The spacing of the joint, um, the size of the joint width, as well as the curling stresses uh, are, are very important. Um, when it comes to um, 
joint design and they are directly related to the thermal capacity and the thermal properties of the concrete pavement. So again, that is why coefficient of thermal expansion is such an important measurement uh, when it comes to characterizing material properties. We also measured the, the electric resistivity of, um, of the concrete and for the most part, and, and this table shows you the, um, uh, the, the ranges um, of from, from very high permeability to negligible permeability. And for both the concrete pavements on the left side of the screen is um, I-69 and on the right side of the screen is US-131. And for the most part, um, the permeability uh, was ranging from very low to moderate. So um, th these were acceptable concretes when it came to the permeability or the electric resistivity. So just as 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 higher the resistivity, the better is the permeability. Uh, is the lower is the permeability, lower is the resistivity, the higher is the permeability. So uh, so so that's just how you look at this th this table. And both I-69 and US-131 concretes were within very low to moderate levels of, of permeability, which is, which is what you're looking for. We also then ran um, scaling tests. And again, these tests are critical, especially in places where concrete is exposed to freestyle uh, free damage. And there are two parts to the scaling test. One is you determine the absorption, uh, the water, the moisture absorption of the concrete, and then you run the scaling test. And the way you run the scaling test is you flood the concrete with a solution of sodium chloride for a certain number of hours, then you drain the sodium chloride and then freeze the sample. Uh, and you expose the, the concrete to number of cycles of sodium chloride and freezing uh, because the sodium chloride will thaw them, will will prevent the freezing, and then when you freeze it, the concrete will freeze. Of course, the moisture inside the concrete will freeze, and if the concrete is susceptible to freeze thaw, you will get fracturing. And what we found was that based on the samples, we found that I sixty nine samples, and these are sort of the yellow and the green and the blue squares showed a higher absorption rate um, of moisture. And when we exposed that concrete to the freeze thaw cycles or, or determined the scaling, we found that the I-69 samples were more susceptible to scaling as compared to the US-131 samples. And just so that you understand what I mean, uh, this picture on the left where you see my cursor is the sample from I-69, and you can clearly see the surface. There is a loss of cement paste and a lot of exposed aggregate. As compared to the US-131 sample, you can see the matrix is still intact. So this is, uh, so where my cursor is, is US-131, which is showing less scaling as compared to I-69. So this, this is a cause of concern and this will have to be monitored over time. Now, please remember these pavements are only four or five years old. Um, so it's gonna take some time for the scaling to completely manifest and show if there truly is a problem uh, with scaling. Now, of course, what we are showing, what I'm showing you here are lab tests under fairly aggressive uh, aggressive conditions. So again, this is not what the real pavement is exhibiting. This is what the lab specimen is exhibiting. So there is a difference between what a real pavement exhibits because it takes time. Whereas when you expose something in the lab, it's very aggressive testing um, to, to exaggerate the effect of sodium chloride. So, but again, there are some indications that the I-69 concrete may be freestyle or scaling susceptible. That's all I can say is susceptible because there is no evidence that scaling has taken place. But nonetheless, this is this is a way to um, another way to look at the durability of the concrete. I want to switch gears and go to some uh, examples of um, uh, structural analysis um, and one equipment that um, 
is routinely used to analyze a concrete pavement after it's constructed is the falling weight deflectometer. I'm assuming, um, I know there are falling weight deflectometers in India and they have been used to evaluate uh, both concrete and asphalt pavements. So the equipment should not be uh, new to you, but essentially it's, um, it's, 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 it's a weight. Uh, that is on a hammer that is dropped on the surface of the pavement, and there are seven geophones uh, attached uh, to the um, to the falling weight deflectometer, and they and they essentially pick up deflections, and we then use those deflections uh, to interpret um, the structural integrity of the, of the pavement, whether it's concrete or asphalt. And there are different things you can do with the falling weight deflectometer. You can apply the weight in the middle of the slab to determine uh, and back calculate the elastic modulus of the concrete and the modulus of subgrade reaction of the of the subgrade. Um, you can test the joint for load transfer efficiency. Remember, these joints have dowel bars in them to see what is how much deflection gets transferred from one side of the slab to the other side of the slab because you want to maximize those that load transfer efficiency. You can also look at the impact of shoulder, whether you have a concrete shoulder or an asphalt shoulder or a gravel shoulder. So the stiffer the shoulder, the better is going to be this lateral support that the shoulder provides the main pavement. Uh, the less stiff the pavement, uh, the less stiff the shoulder, uh, the less is going to be the lateral support that the shoulder provides to uh, the main line concrete pavement. And then also you can measure uh, the possible voids under under a concrete pavement. The voids could be due to erosion, poor compaction, poor construction, um, and and the falling weight deflectometer allows you to measure um, or at least predict or estimate um, the possibility of voids uh, that exist under the concrete pavement. So the falling weight deflectometer is a is a is a very versatile tool um, where you can calculate in a very short period of time the structural integrity of a concrete pavement or for an asphalt pavement. Um, so the falling weight deflectometer measurements do get impacted by the geometric deformation of a concrete slab. Um, and what I mean by the geometric deformation of a concrete slab is that during the daytime, the surface of the slab is hot and the bottom of the slab is not as hot. And when that happens, the slab is positively curved because there is a positive temperature gradient in the concrete slab. So this picture, this little cartoon that you're seeing is telling you that the surface temperature is hotter than the underside of the, temp of the slab. And when that happens, the, the, the skin of the slab expands and you get this positive gradient or it's, uh, this, this is called positive curling uh, of the concrete slab. When the temperatures cool in the evening time, the reverse happens. That is, the top of the pavement is cooler and the bottom of the slab is hotter. So you have a negative gradient. And when you have a negative gradient, the edges of the slab lift off from the, surf, from the, from the support and you get this negative curve. So, if you were to do a falling weight deflectometer on the joint when the slab is positively curled, you will get artificially lower deflections. Versus if you were to do a falling weight deflectometer when the slab was negatively curled, you will get artificially higher deflections. So that doesn't mean that the, that the joint is, is good or bad, it is, the deflections are a result of the geometric deformation of the concrete slab. And the geometric deformation could be either positively curled or negatively curled as a function of the temperature gradient that exists across the thickness of the slab. This is a very fundamental concept that anyone in the business of concrete pavements should be aware of, and especially when you are measuring deflections. So it's not theoretical. This is actually, we demonstrated this in the field. So what you're seeing here is along the X axis, you're, it's time along the Y axis, it's temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. 
And the three curves that you are seeing are the placements of thermocouples where we actually measured the temperature gradient. So the gray line is a thermocouple that was placed one and a half inches below the surface. The blue line is the temperature that was measured nine and a half inches below the surface. And the orange line is about five and a quarter inches below the surface. So if you look at this part here, the slab was positively curved because the surface, the gray line, was hotter than the blue line. And the orange line was somewhere in between. So in reality, we measured, when we measured the temperature, there was actual positive curl in the concrete pavement, just like the, the, the theoretical picture I showed you. Conversely, during the evening time, you see a reversal in temperature gradient. You see that the gray line is the top of the slab, which is cooler in the evening, whereas the blue line, which is the bottom of the slab or close to the bottom of the slab, is hotter than the surface, and the slab was, was negatively curved. So what we have seen theoretically does happen in the field practically. So it is important that you're able to understand the relationship between deflection measurements and the geometric deformations of these concrete slabs. The other piece is load transfer efficiency. Um, and load transfer efficiency, uh, I'll just uh, show you these three things. That the load transfer efficiency ranges from 0% to 100%. 100% being perfect load transfer efficiency, 0% means there is no load transfer efficiency. A brand new pavement should be as close to 100% as possible. It'll never be 100%, but as close to 100% as possible. And the way you calculate load transfer efficiency, it's the ratio of the deflection of the unloaded side divided by the deflection of the loaded side times 100, and that will express the load transfer efficiency in terms of a percentage. There are other measures that can be used to determine the efficiency of the joint, which are actually more reliable than the load transfer. One is known as differential deflection or DD. That is, what is the difference, the absolute difference in the deflections of the loaded side of the slab versus the unloaded slide of the slab? And the third measure is differential energy. That is, how much energy is transmitted from one side of the slab to the other side of the slab, and how much energy is going into the foundation layers. When we design a concrete pavement, we are designing a concrete pavement in such a way that deflections and stresses are transferred from one slab to the other. We do not want the deflections and the stresses to go into the foundation layers. That is the basic principle of concrete pavement design, which is quite different from the principles of asphalt pavement design. So we want to minimize the amount of deflections and stresses that go into the foundation layers. We want to maximize the amount of deflection and stresses that are transferred from one slab to the other. So these are examples or ways by which you can determine how effectively your joint is transferring deflections from one side of the slab to the other side of the slab, okay? The load transfer efficiency is the easiest to understand, but is the most approximate. So let me give you a quick example. If the load transfer efficiency is 90%, which is considered very, very good, I can take nine and divide it by 10. That's 90%. But I can also take 900 and divide it by 1,000. That is also 90%. But which one is a better joint? Nine divided by 10 or 900 divided by 1,000? Clearly, 9 divided by 10 is a better load transfer efficiency because the deflections are lower versus 900 divided by 1,000. Even though it's 90%, the slabs are deflecting a lot more. 
So this is the, the limitation of load transfer efficiencies because it doesn't tell you what the deflections are. It only tells you what the percentage is. So the percentages can be sometimes misleading. Now, if I apply the same example to differential deflection, it's gonna be obvious 10 minus nine is one, 1000 minus 900 is 100. Clearly one is better than 100. There is no, there is no guesswork there. So differential deflection is a much better way to determine the efficiency or how well the joint is doing. But that's a, that's, that's a conversation, a more detailed conversation for maybe a different uh, technology talk. So here's some real, ex uh, here's some real testing data from, um, uh, from a, a project. The black diamonds that you see are the pavement temperatures and the open squares that you see uh, was the measured load transfer efficiency. And, and that is a trend when there is a lower temperature, the deflections are lower uh, the, the low transfer efficiency is lower when, when the temperatures are higher, the low transfer efficiencies in general are higher. Again, that's got to do with the positive and negative curling. But for the most part, the, 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 the low transfer efficiencies are in excess of 90% of for a brand new pavement, which is a very good, uh, which is a very good um, indication of the structural integrity of the joint. This is uh, showing you the relationship between low transfer efficiency and pavement temperature for I-69, and this is for US-131. Um, for the most part, the, the long life concrete pavements are doing better in, or, or the low transfer efficiencies are, are higher as compared to the, the conventional pavements. Uh, in in uh, in I sixty nine as well as U S one thirty nine, but in I sixty nine, if you if if you remember in the opening, I had said there were two dowel diameters. The conventional pavement had a one point two five inch diameter, whereas the long life pavement had a one and a half inch diameter. So not only are we see so this is also showing you the positive impact of a larger diameter dowel bar. Um, whereas in, in US 131, both the pavements had the same diameter dowel bar. So you don't, there is no way to differentiate between uh, the impact of the dowel diameter because they were exactly the same. But again, for the most part, uh, the low transfer efficiencies of the long life concrete pavements were in excess of 90%. So there really wasn't a big, big issue there. And then, so we, we took all this information and we took all this real material information and ran a performance prediction algorithm uh, to determine whether these pavements will truly last 30 years or whether these pavements will truly last 50 years. So this is for I-69 and we looked at the right quality, which is, which is measured in the International Roughness Index we looked at joint faulting and we looked at transverse cracking. And you will find that in all the cases for all these structural and functional parameters, the long life pavements easily met the 30 year design life. There was really no problem. The red horizontal line are the thresholds of failure. And in no instance did the long life pavement go beyond the threshold. They are significantly below the threshold. So there really was no problem with the structural design. And we use real material inputs to predict this performance. And we applied the same logic to the 50 year design. And in no instance did the 50 year designs, and these are the lines that I'm pointing my, my cursor to, um, exceeded the threshold. So again, the 50 year designs met the 50 year criteria using real material data that we had quantified from the actual pavement. So this, this gives us a lot of confidence in the design of a 30 year pavement as well as the design of a 50 year, 50 year pavement. So what I wanna show you just quickly, um, the construction sequence. Um, uh, so this is, this is what the pavement looked like before it was uh, before it was um, reconstructed. There was a lot of patchwork, a lot of distresses in the concrete pavement. 
This is a picture of the subgrade um, receiving cement stabilization. Um, this is the compacted subgrade after the stabilization was done. As you can see, uh, um, that the subgrade looks very very uniform and and it's uh, rigid. Uh, this is um, this is a geotextile that was placed between the permeable drainage course and the aggregate base to prevent. Um, uh, to, to, to prevent the puncturing and the filling in of the voids in a permeable, ba in, in a permeable base. Um, this is the, the cement stabilized permeable base that is being placed. And then this is what the completed project looks like. So this just gives you a, a, a quick uh, illustration of the progression of the construction that took place uh, for the long life concrete pavements. So, in conclusion, I, I, I want you to take away these um, these concluding remarks that uh, the structural performance for both the 30 year and the 50 year um, uh, design uh, designs sort of met the long life criteria. Um, it's hard to tell about the material related distresses because the pavements are only five or six years old and typically um, that is not enough time for material related distresses to show up if they were going to show up. So we'll have to wait a little longer uh, to determine whether it met the MRD criteria or not. Generally speaking, larger dollar diameters um, tend to improve joint continuity and performance. Um, the role of construction, drainage, and material durability cannot be understated. It's it's extremely cannot be overstated. Actually, is is extremely important in the performance of um, pavements. Period. Whether it's long life or regular pavements. And again, what I started off with that we must follow a systems approach uh, to concrete pavement design as well, concrete pavement construction as well as asphalt pavement construction, in order to meet. Uh, these long life criteria, whether it's asphalt or concrete. So that concludes my my presentation. Um, uh, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I realize uh, this is getting late in the late in the evening, um, but I really enjoyed uh, making this presentation and, and hopefully this can lead to a future dialogue um, between the research agencies, universities, and if there's any way I can help, um, because this was a real good experiment that I was fortunate to be a part of. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, time for interaction. Uh, there are many people are there. Experts are many experts are also joined the program. Thank you. So, if you want to post the question, you can either uh, message it or you can ask the questions now. Suresh. Good evening, sir. This is Suresh. Uh, Professor Neeraj, Hi. this is Suresh. How are you, sir? Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, it's a very good presentation. I am uh, used to see your uh, very attractive presentation, well, well informed uh, contents in your presentation. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you. One of my PhD scholar, he worked on this low transfer efficiency. Yes. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, that second one using larger double diameter that will improve the joint continuity and performance. But my question is, uh, in the case of thin layer payments, like uh, thin white topping or ultra thin white topping, uh, what's your thought on uh, uh, these kinds of payments? Uh, we have to depend on uh, aggregate interlocking only, it seems. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so clear, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it's good you asked me that question, Suresha. So the, the diameter of the doll bar is also a function of the thickness of the slab. So you cannot have a hundred millimeter slab and put in a 38 millimeter doll bar. That has to be a concrete to steel ratio that is acceptable. So typically pavements that are 250 millimeters thicker and higher can, can have a larger diameter in pavements that are 250 millimeters or thinner should have a smaller diameter. So I, I do wanna make that clarification. Now, specifically to your question, 
when you're looking at thin white toppings and especially ultra thin white topping, um, the reason, well, you cannot put a doll bar in it because it's just simply because the size, the thickness of the slab is, is, is about 100 millimeters. So you really cannot have a dowel, dowel in it. What happens in those cases is that you have significantly larger number of joints, first of all. So the, 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 the length of the slab is much shorter. So that helps because you, you don't, you eliminate or minimize the curling of the slab. That's one reason. The joints are much tighter. They are much closer to, you know, the width of the joint is much tighter. So you are engaging in a fair amount of aggregate interlock that allows low transfer efficiency. And the biggest advantage, especially for thin or especially for ultra thin white topping is that it is sitting on an asphalt pavement which provides a significant amount of support under the concrete slab. So those are the reasons why in an ultra thin white topping or a thin white topping, we do not provide dowel bars because the necessity is not there. Thanks for that, Professor. Uh, one more uh, uh, information I would like to know. Uh, in India, IT Kadakpur, Professor Amarnath Reddy and Professor uh, K. Sudhakar Reddy, they are working on short panel concrete payments that are exactly similar to ultra thin white topping. Uh, my concern is uh, since uh, in these short panel section, number of joints per kilometer will be more, does yes. it affect the riding quality? Uh, how was you, I mean, how is your experience from US roads? Yeah, so uh, again, and this goes back to my point about the quality of construction. So clearly when you have more joints, you have more maintenance of joints, uh, but if the joints are properly sawed in a, in a, in a timely fashion, uh, and there might be some need for diamond grinding to uh, improve the right quality. But again, if the quality of the construction is good, then the presence of joints or large number of joints should not take away from the quality of ride um, is, is what I've noticed and what I've experienced. But again, it is the, the right timing of the joints as well as the quality of, of construction. All these have to be taken into consideration uh, when it comes to thin white topping or, or short panel joints or short panel concrete pavements. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Yeah, sir. In continuation to that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, this particular project of AT Karakur, there was one criticism which was raised in IRC is uh, when you have more number of joints, uh, you'll have more uh, noise uh, uh, issues, uh, noise pollution. Now, what is your opinion on that? Or your so, uh, yeah. So again, this is uh, this is that pavement tire interaction and the pavement tire noise, and that also has to do with. Um, uh, the kind of aggregate. So in Europe, they, they started using exposed aggregates um, because when you have exposed aggregates, um, uh, those aggregates tend to absorb uh, some of the noise that comes from when the tire rolls over a concrete pavement. Um, and that has proven to be quite successful. Um, so again, this goes back to this goes back to um, construction and uh, again also the tining uh, of the concrete pavement. These longitudinal tines uh, that are placed on the concrete pavement also help in absorbing uh, some of the noise uh, that a concrete pavement um, uh, experiences. Uh, so again, these are these are attributes that need to be considered. Uh, before taking on uh, the construction of a concrete pavement. But noise is a real issue and, and there are ways to um, mitigate uh, large decibels of noise. Thank you, sir. I, I think, uh, Professor, could you be a sir? Sir, Professor? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it was an excellent uh, talk by Professor Neeraj. Thank you thank for you. Uh, sharing you. your uh, experience uh, based on a real project in New York. See, I just uh, would like to uh, know a small thing. I The one thing which uh, I appreciate in your lecture or lesson, which I have uh, again got it reinforced, is that the sub-base layers or the underneath layers below the concrete layer is the one which uh, 
uh, actually decides the life of the patient. I think yes. I am right in uh, that kind of a conclusion. See, yes. Uh, yes. That's right. So the second point which I find here is that, uh, uh, I mean, again, I would like to stress because this is something which uh, all the people who are listening should understand is that putting a superficial layer or the surface layer uh, with more strength will not yield you a long lasting paint. The yes. second point which I just noticed is here is that you're using a 25 megapascal concrete. Yes, is, I think uh, it's M25 here in terms of Indian standards. Okay. So. Uh, but we, I think it, from my memory, I tell you that it's around M40. That's what 40 megapascal is the one which we use in the concrete. Is it uh, due to the temperature differences in New York and in uh, Indian conditions or uh, I don't know uh, exactly if you could throw some light into it. Yeah. And probably the researchers who are doing it probably could uh, compare the results of these two. Yeah, so let me first go to your uh, question about or your observation about uh, about the base materials or the foundation layers. So one critical role that these foundation materials play in concrete pavements is providing uniformity of support. Because if you have non uniform support under a concrete pavement, you get a lot of cantilever action and you can get a lot of cracks that occur on the on the surface of the concrete pavement. So. The base, the sub base and the subgrade are so critical to provide uniform support to the slab and 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 the uniform support of the slab also helps. Uh, improve the right quality of the concrete pavement. So that is sort of 1 observation. Regarding the strength. You don't need high strength in paving concrete, you know, 25, you know, 20 to 25 megapascals is more than enough. To sustain because because uh, remember. This is a slab, you know, we are, we are behave. We, we are relying on the slab action. We are not relying on the individual strength of the concrete. That is going to carry the load. It is we are because we are designing a, a system. We are designing slabs. We've got dowels. We've got joints. We've got multiple connected slabs that are going to transfer the deflection as well as uh, the stresses. So that is why strength is important, but we don't need 40, 50 megapascal concrete strength in order to carry the load. Um, the stresses due to the due to the due to the axles of of, of trucks. It's got nothing to do with whether it's hot or cold. Um, the hot or cold is to be addressed through the 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 durability of the concrete, the quality of the aggregate that is used, the air entrainment that we do that handles um, the climatic or the environmental differences that might exist within a country or within a state. So. Um, very rarely is high strength concrete used uh, for paving concrete. Um, 3500 PSI, or as, as you noted, 25 megapascals, 30 megapascal is more than enough uh, in terms of uh, in, in 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 terms of the compressive strength of concrete. So strength is really not an issue once you've achieved that baseline strength. Yeah, in that case, I mean you're. I mean. Uh... Uh, in that case, probably, I think there is a revision required for the ports of practice in India. Yeah, I mean, at least in the US, in the US, we don't target more than 3500 PSI uh, or 25 megapascal, unless that is something really special that needs to happen, then there might be exceptions. But the rule is, um, you know, 3500 PSI is about about the right compressive strength needed for um, for paving concrete. So if the temperature variations are more, then you'll have to increase the thickness of the slab. Well, not really, you, 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 because again, remember, if you increase the thickness of the slab, you might increase the gradient, the temperature gradient. So again, the way you counter environmental effects is through the spacing of the, of the joints. So you okay. can shorten the joint spacing and reduce the curling stresses. Um, okay. Because the curling stresses are directly related to the thermal gradient in a concrete pavement. So you increase thickness if you need. There are other ways to improve structural integrity. Thickness is not the only way. Thickness is probably the most expensive way to do it. There are other ways to 
accommodate uh, structural integrity or uh, increased structural integrity. The width of the pavement can be changed. Uh, the shoulder of the, the shoulder can go from gravel shoulder to concrete shoulder. All these things do help in improving the, the structural integrity of the concrete pavement. I think this is the easiest thing to do, uh, but probably is not the only thing to do. There are other ways to mitigate high stresses. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, you have gone uh, shown uh, a lot of insights into all these things. Probably some kind of a joint uh, research could happen. I don't know. This NatPRAC could happen. It. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to collaborate. Yes. Professor uh, Niraj, I hope that you know Professor uh, Mujiriya. No, no, no. No, okay. No, I, no. I yeah, no, he, you, he yeah. is a student or a, a student of uh, Professor Veera Raghavan, and he is a senior of Professor Veera Raghavan. Oh, okay, yes, of course. Uh, everyone and, knows uh, Veera. Everyone knows him. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, happened to be a student of uh, uh, just uh, he, he did his PhD at uh, 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 Bangalore uh, University. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, he's the founder, vice chancellor of uh, Kerala Techni Technological University. Oh, excellent, excellent, yes. <laughs> and expert in uh, payment engineering. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, other questions, sir? So, Begumar, you are also there, we could see. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good afternoon, Professor uh, Neeraj. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Myself, Neetu Roy. Uh, I have a question regarding the stabilization that you have adopted uh, for the soil separate. I saw that uh, one place you have gone for a chemical stabilization and the other one was a uh, cement stabilization. Was there any specific reasons for uh, choosing this or? Yeah, I, I think chemically was still cement stabilization. I, it's just probably a different use of words, but it was all cement oh, stabilization. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. And again, remember, you know, we were brought in to do the research after the pavements were constructed. So we had no input as a research team uh, on the construction parameters and the construction uh, and, and the design parameters. The, the the Michigan Department of Transportation, they designed the pavement and they, um, they oversaw the construction. Uh, because also these are the, the pavements that were chosen are part of the regular interstate system. These are not, uh, these are not test sections that were constructed on the side of the road. These are part of the regular mainline pavement. So, um, uh, we, and, that, and that's why we had no input into into the into the construction. Uh, we were brought in uh, to sort of analyze what was done after the construction and once the pavements were open to traffic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Neither completed her PhD with the Raghun sir as well as Murli Krishna IT Madras. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> So we have a question in the chat box uh, from our scientist, Shijit. Thank you for this ex excellent presentation. I would like to know your view on precast concrete panels and their performance. Um, lately, I have not been doing work on that, but um, I worked on precast panels for at least 10, 11 years. Uh, and it is, it is a good alternative. Um, especially for rehabilitation. It has now obviously also the, the applications have moved on to new construction, but it really started as a repair technique uh, for concrete pavements uh, because the repair technique did not take as long time, as long of a time as in situ concrete patching takes place. Um, and the quality control is much better because uh, precast concrete is factory made concrete. Um, and I would say in the United States, at least, and I know there was a project in India, I think in Nagpur, where uh, precast panels were used for CRC concrete. Uh, 
So I have I, I know in the U.S. Um, uh, precast panels have been used now even for new construction, um, and uh, conventional precast panels have been used just jointed plain concrete pavements, but also. Uh, pre-stress um, panels have been used uh, as part of uh, new construction. So it, it is definitely gaining a lot of momentum in the United States. Um, it, but again, it is one one more alternative uh, to repair concrete pavements as well as to construct new pavements in, 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 in with concrete. So it is a good strategy. Uh, but it comes with all its, um, you know, it comes with the same cautions as any any construction comes with. Again, the quality of construction in, in precast concrete, the quality of construction is even more important um, because remember you're bringing an already hardened slab of concrete to the field. You have to make sure these panels fit because if if the dimensions are not appropriate, the panels will not fit, and if the panels don't fit, you have a problem in the field. At least with fresh concrete, there is no issue of the panels fitting because it's flowable concrete. The the concrete will flow. So with with precast concrete, uh, the quality of construction uh, even becomes more significant uh, variable or or an attribute than it does with conventional paving concrete. Thank you, sir. Uh, Shajid, do you have any further question? Okay. Any other question, participants? Yeah, it must be ordered like to ask. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Dr. Himashri. I am a structural engineer, so I would like to work on precast uh, panels. And I have a doubt like there is is there any size specification or limitation for these precast panels? Like uh, how much should be or how much it should not be? Well, so if you're using precast panels for concrete pavements, the size is going to be dictated by if you're using it for repair, the size is going to be dictated by what the existing panel sizes are. You, you can't go longer than that, those sizes. So, and if you're building a brand new pavement, uh, and if you're using jointed plain concrete pavements, the panels should not be, you know, the joint spacing should not be more than four and a half, five meters long. Um, the other is the size of the truck you're going to use, you know, because you cannot have huge panels because transportation of the panels from the precast factory to the job site will become a big problem. So the size is going to be dictated by the design as well as what you can transport. Um, also, the, the lifting equipment, the crane that you are going to use. Um, because if you have very large panels, the, the, the weight of the slab is going to be excessive. And also, if you're going to use uh, large panels and when you lift it, you're going to put in a lot of lifting stresses on the panel. So you can actually break the panel. Uh, so in order to counter the lifting stresses, you might need a lot of reinforcement in the concrete. Uh, so again, all these are practical issues that you want to keep in mind before you start sizing a panel. So uh, very large panels are not for, for pavement construction. I'm not talking about bridge construction. I'm not talking about building construction because it's a completely different mechanics there. I'm talking about concrete pavements because that's what I understand the best. Uh, the size um, is an issue uh, from a construction standpoint as well as a transportation standpoint and an installation standpoint. Thank you, sir. Sir, myself, Wilson Casey. Uh, I have one doubt. Actually, is there any specific reason for providing uh, drainage layer immediately below the slab, uh, concrete slab? So the drainage is usually in the in in the base or the sub base, and and you can there are. Many ways to do that. One way we demonstrated in this project is to use a drainable base so that if any moisture that gets through the joints or through the slab goes into the drainable base and because of the, the, the cross slope, the water flows to the sides. And if you have an edge drain, 
placed at uh, at the edge of the concrete pavement and the shoulder, the edge drain collects all the water that drains out from the base and then goes into a ditch. So that's the best way to drain water away from the pavement. The idea is to keep the water as far away from the pavement as possible and, and get rid of that water as quickly as possible because the water starts to, to pond under, under the slab, the soil is gonna lose its shear strength and you can have all, you, you, you can have cracking in, in the concrete pavement because the support, the, uh, the support is been compromised because uh, the rigidity, the stiffness of the soil is, is compromised. So yes, drainage is so important uh, in a concrete pavement. For that matter, even in an asphalt pavement, drainage is important to pavements period. It doesn't matter which pavement you're using. Thank you, sir. Any more questions, sir? So thank you, thank you so much for your nice presentation and for clarifying the doubts thank of you, the participants. Now, yeah. uh, now I invite Chandra Pradhan, our scientist, Highway Analysis and Purchase Division, KSST NADPAC, for delivering the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, all. It's a great pleasure for me to express our sincere gratitude for the insightful and thought-provoking speech delivered by our esteemed professor. The professor's discourse has illuminated our minds, offering an understanding of the long-lasting long -lasting payments and the methods uh, they are adopting, especially with respect to the materials and the quality testings. I hope this gathering has been enriched by the knowledge and the expertise shared by the professor. And on, on behalf of all present here, I extend our heartfelt thanks. We are grateful not only for the professor's words, but also for the time and effort he invested in pre preparing this enlightening speech. I would also like to extend our gratitude to the institution and the individuals who made it possible for us to benefit from the professor's expert, expertise. As we depart from this gathering, let us carry with us not only the knowledge gained, but also the inspiration to continue seeking, learning, and growing. Once again, thank you, Professor Neeraj Butch, for raising us with your presence and sharing your wealth of knowledge. To the audience, thank you for your attentive presence and for embracing the spirit of intellectual exchange. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Neeraj. Thank you. Next visit to India. Um, probably in, 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 in December, um, okay. yeah, so yeah, any but, plan to sit the South, do you have any program? With, uh, no, with no, not, not, not this time, uh, but in the future, if there are opportunities, I can always, uh, coordinate my, my trip to India with, uh, opportunities, um, uh, with institutions like yours or universities, um, always happy to um, engage. Yeah, please, Professor. Probably uh, listen. Uh, someday, probably you can visit the uh, NetBank or some other institutes around the world. Sure, sure, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Uh, yeah, have a great yes. evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Now we have come to the end of the session. So thank you all the participants for joining us.